sales prospecting for MSP. A little bit about me. I've got about 20 years of experience with outbound sales prospecting, inside sales and field sales, and I've been running managed sales rows for about two and a half years now. So we have built a sales prospecting engine internally here that took us from zero dollars in monthly recurring revenue to over two hundred thousand dollars in monthly recurring revenue in under two years. And that's really the only exciting part of my bio. I don't want to go into history and who I've worked for and what I've done. We use cold calling to build an enormously successful business in a very short period of time. And we've taken that information and we've translated it into success for our clients as well. So we have over 30 callers right now. All of them are trained to sell two or four managed service providers. And we can have a caller now fully trained and performing, meaning they can schedule meetings unassisted without our help in about two weeks' time. All of our callers are located here in North America, either remotely from their own homes or in our new call center in Las Vegas. And we offer prospecting training, prospecting consulting, and a completely done-for-you outbound prospecting solution. So today what I was hoping to share with you is how you can go about making the decision on whether you should hire in-house or whether you should outsource and what you should be looking for in an outsource provider. So there's a lot of different options and I thought I would review all of them with you. I mean, obviously I want you to know right from the beginning I'm invested in the decision that you make. I own an outsourced prospecting company. But there are lots of features, benefits, pros and cons to all different options and I've tried to go about being as unbiased as possible to give you the best information that I can. I mean obviously I think we're the best at it but we aren't going to be the right choice for every company for a lot of different reasons. So thanks for joining me today and I'm going to keep it as unsalesy as possible. So we firmly believe here that CEOs shouldn't be taking low percentage shots when it comes to outbound prospecting. So if you're going to do your own sales prospecting personally, we really think that you should focus peer to peer, which means business owner to business owner, and really focus on building a referral network more than cold calling blindly into your market. The only exception to that rule for me would be if you are a brand new managed services owner, and if you have zero clients and you're just getting into the game, you should absolutely be on the phone cold calling. So I really want you to think about cold calling being a feature that can move your business forward. So when I, um, when I run numbers for companies, for example, if you can assume that your average deal is going to be a $2,000 month monthly recurring deal and you can make a minimum of 100 dials a day, you can realistically add over $500,000 of monthly recurring revenue to your pipeline in under two years. So that's a big number and it's an aggressive number and it's totally possible and we've seen it done. So that's the one reason that I want you to have in the back of your mind while we move forward in this. You can decide to do nothing or you can decide to start prospecting and I think that there's a very attractive pot of gold at the end of the rainbow if you're going to consider this as a solution. So what are your choices when it comes to outbound prospecting? Well, obviously your first choice is you could do nothing. You can continue to rely on word of mouth referrals, but I guarantee you that eventually those referrals are going to dry up. Most of the companies that have come to us, without exception, said, Carrie, we used to have a great word of mouth referral program. Leads just kept coming in the door and, you know, over the last quarter they've just dried up and they had nothing there to replace that revenue with. So as they were experiencing some attrition in their client base, these referrals also stopped coming in and now they were left in a very undesirable financial position with a very empty pipeline. So you could do nothing, but I would encourage you to consider some of these options. If you'd like to get different results, you need to try different things and we never never encourage companies to do cold calling with the exclusion of anything else in the market. I firmly believe you need to do a lot of different things. Yes, we built our business cold calling, but I guarantee you, you saw us at trade shows and you probably received one of our newsletters. We do a lot of different customer touch points and we expect that companies like yours will be doing that as well. So the choices here are, you can hire somebody in-house. You can hire an external contractor that you're going to manage in-house, so a 1099 remote employee or contractor. You can hire an outsourced provider from an offshore organization. You can hire an outsourced provider 
that offers you a paper lead or a paper dial pricing model. You can engage an outsourced provider that offers you a flat rate service, or you can engage an outsourced provider that's niche specific. And obviously that's us, that's why I have it highlighted. <laughs> and of course, I think it's the best choice, but I'm going to actually validate that later in the webinar. So you wanna make the right choice. Let's start with an in-house hire. So assuming you get it right, assuming you get it exactly right, the in-house hire is always going to be your best choice. It's less expensive long-term, you get a committed team member, somebody that you can engage with day in and day out, you'll have more control over the process, and your in-house rep is gonna be able to engage differently and more deeply than any outsourced provider ever could, and that's likely the biggest benefit to hiring in-house. So your in-house caller will be able to do things like use LinkedIn and other social media that's attached to your company brand, things that you can't really give to an outsourced provider to use. They'll have local connections, they'll be able to invite people to local events, you can join BNI groups, you can create those deep referral networks, those are things that an outsourced company simply can't provide. So if there's one big feature on the pro side for hiring in-house, it's that amount of control and connection you get in your community when you hire someone in-house. But here are the big considerations. Are you ready to start prospecting in-house? So there are some considerations you want to consider <laughs> before you engage somebody to come work for you in a prospecting capacity. First of all, how are you going to find your new sales prospector? Personally, we've had a lot of success on different job boards. We've tried Indeed, that works pretty well, and it's, they've got kind of a pay for performance model, so if nobody clicks on your ad, you don't pay for it. Uh, we've used Craigslist, Craigslist with some success in the US, but not in Canada. And we've used LinkedIn postings, and they've actually generated a pretty high caliber of um, application, of ap pardon me, of applicant. So those are three that we've tried successfully. You have to write the job ad correctly in order to attract the right talent. So you want to avoid saying things like telemarketing. As much as this job is telemarketing, the word telemarketing immediately turns people off. And we experienced uh, in different markets when we were advertising, some language doesn't work in those markets. So for example, we have a call center in Las Vegas and we had been advertising for lead generators. And one of our team members here in the Vegas office came to me one day and said, Carrie, I think one of the reasons that we're not getting the quality of applicant that we want out here is that in Las Vegas, it means this. Like there is a, uh, a call center industry in Las Vegas and almost a hierarchy and a lead generator is the lowest thing on the totem pole. It means they're handing you a phone book and you're expected to go through the phone book and call in blindly. What we're doing here is sales appointment setting and that means we've already pre-qualified the leads that are going to the reps that are gonna make the dials. It's a much more attractive job. It pays a little bit better and it's got less of a, um, used car salesman feel to it, why don't we change the wording of our ad to attract sales appointment setters, not lead generators. You're going to get a better caliber of applicant. So that was one market by market indicator that we wouldn't have known about not being in the market. So if you want to think about how are you going to write the job ad, start looking in your local job listing boards and see how people are wording them so that you can kind of take that, copy it, make it your own and replicate it. So what tools are you going to need to provide them with to do their jobs? That really depends on what you've already got. So if you're using a PSA, for example, are you going to set up your PSA for them to operate in? Are you going to purchase a new CRM or are you already using a CRM? How are you going to set this up effectively? How are you going to automate some steps so that they can make more calls in less time? And how are you going to measure their short-term and medium-term performance? So quite often when a company calls us and says, you know what, we're looking for a lead generation company, uh, we tried a telemarketer, it didn't work out for us. The first thing I want to know is, well, how long did they work with you? And why didn't it work? And they will say like, oh, well, they worked for us for three months and they didn't get any appointments at all. To which I would reply, well, that's not actually that uncommon. So quite often the expectations that companies have when they're hiring a brand new lead generator are unrealistic. Your sales cycle is quite long. Sometimes things drop out of the sky, but if there are two kind of sides to the spectrum of telemarketing, on one side you have what I would describe as a dis 
disruption sales cycle, which means you've got a brand new idea, a brand new technology, something no one's ever heard of, so something that no one has possibly purchased yet, and there's not a big long period of waiting before they purchase that item. IT support, however, as, as great and as wonderful and as exciting as your particular brand of managed services is, odds are, whether real or perceived, they're already solving that problem in some way. So managed services is what I would describe as a displacement sales cycle, which means you're waiting out their current provider. Either they're in a contract already or they're solving the problem in some way, and now you're really just biding your time to bump that provider out. There's very few, there's very little that you can do to dislodge what I would describe as an embedded provider in a company. So quite often what your telemarketer or your sales lead generator or your prospector or whatever you'd like to call them is doing is just minding their time, making sure that they're constantly touching those leads, making sure that when it's time for them to make their next purchase decision, the only company they're going to consider is yours. So expecting somebody to come in and perform right off the bat and fill your sales funnel full of exciting new opportunities, that very rarely happens because there aren't as many of them out there as you would think. The opportunities that drop out of the sky into your lap those are quite often the ones that aren't going to go very well for you. Something is on fire. Right? You've called a company and they said, yep, you know what, we hate the company we're working with. Come on in, sell us something new. I think quite often when you go into that meeting, you learn that you're probably the fourth company that they've had come in. And they fire their IT company every six to eight months and everybody is an idiot except for them. Those opportunities quite often aren't the ones you want. The ones that you want are the ones that you need to work for. And that's what you're bringing in a sales prospector to do. You're bringing them in to lay that foundation for sales success. You're not bringing them in to pick off low-hanging fruit. You know your uh, community well. You should know where that low-hanging fruit is. You're bringing them in to babysit your pipeline. So measuring short-term and medium-term performance before you start closing deals, and remember, you're not bringing a sales lead generator in to close deals. You're bringing them in to babysit so that you can close deals. You're going to measure things like how many dials did they make, how many conversations did they have, how many of those follow-up conversations turned into appointments. And at the appointment, that's where the real work starts. And I think quite often companies bring in sales lead generators expecting them to be magic. Their goal is to put you in front of someone so that you can have a conversation with them and everything else is your responsibility. So don't bring in a sales lead generator thinking that they are going to sell for you. That isn't their job. They don't have the personality to do it. They're not hunters. They are farmers and door openers. So start your relationship with your in-house prospector on the right foot with the realistic expectation that their goal is to call as many companies as they can eliminate the stuff from the pipeline that you don't want to deal with, keep you from wasting your time on meetings, and then it's your job to make the magic happen. So how are you going to set up your internal systems to support them? That's something you really want to consider before you bring somebody in. Sales lead generators are usually not self-starters. They are risk adverse, they are service oriented, and they take leadership well. You need to have an internal process that you can train your new lead generator to. You need to be able to support them and encourage them. And you need to be able to train them, and somebody is going to have to manage them. Unlike sales reps who can usually come in, figure it out pretty quickly, and then start going off on their own adventures to go close business, Sales lead generators, and we personality profiled. If you'd like to learn more about how we personality profile, just grab me after the webinar, send me a quick email. I'm happy to share the tools that we use. But they really require leadership, management, and encouragement. They aren't independent, free-thinking hunters. So if you're hiring people with the expectation that you're going to be able to promote them into a sales role later on in the process, you're going to be disappointed. A good lead generator becomes a better lead generator or a very mediocre sales rep. So the biggest justification for outsourcing, even in best case in-house scenarios, is revenue. So if you take a look at this, you can see that there's two lines on here. One of them is an outsource revenue line, and the other one is in-house. And the major difference between those lines is the amount of activity that an outsourced company can put into your pipeline quickly 
when you make a new hire, you've probably got a nine-month period where you have to identify a team member, find that team member, hire them, educate them, manage them, train them. You're about nine months away from a fully functioning member of your team, assuming they don't quit. The difference in outsourcing or in-house comes from volume. When you hire an outsourced company, whether it's my company or another company, you get volume, consistent volume, all day, every day, and that's what makes the difference long-term in your revenue line. If you think about it like accrued interest, my parents used to tell me that if I put $20 a week in the bank every week when I, at the age of 16 or whenever they lectured me on it, I didn't do it, by the way, but... If I had done that, now that I am in my 40s, I wouldn't have to save money anymore. All that accrued interest would turn into the invest. Like you don't, you don't retire on the money you save in your last 10 years. You retire on the money you save in the first 10 years. That's exactly what lead generation is like. All the work that you do at the beginning pays off at the end. And if you don't do the work at the beginning, you can't get that end payoff. So if you think about how your sales pipeline works, you start making the calls and those calls turn into follow-up activities, those follow-up activities turn into appointments, and those appointments eventually turn into deals. And it's a very, very small percentage, but you have to get the volume at the top to have the deals come out the bottom. And it's a very attractive revenue line. So this assumes you're starting from zero and you're doing approximately 100 dials a day and your average deal is $2,000 a month. That's how much revenue outsourcing or in-house telemarketing can add to your pipeline in the next two years. However, if you make a bad hire, and this chart here assumes that around the six month mark, you fire them or they leave, you can see that your revenue, your revenue line is going to stay very, very flat because you're going to have to start over again from the beginning. So if there is an argument that isn't cost related, and that is sheer, like, what is the benefit two years from now related? Outsourcing is always going to win because it's always going to be consistent. You're not going to have to worry about that employee coming in, quitting, leaving, starting over. You're just going to flip the switch and we're going to start. So you can see the revenue line stays the same here for outsourcing, but with somebody quitting six months, you don't start to get that curve up that you got last time. So just bear that in mind. As long as everything goes 100% perfect, Doing it in-house is the best idea you'll ever have. Unfortunately, it doesn't always turn out like that. So if you're going to consider outsourcing instead, and there's plenty of great reasons to do so, you've got a couple of different options. You can hire an external contractor that you're going to manage in-house, so a 1099 remote contractor. You can hire an outsourced provider, an offshore company, a paper lead company, a flat rate company, or a niche specific company. So an external contractor, there's some pros to using that. It's a very moderate price point and an often negotiable price point. So the number that they're going to put up isn't necessarily the number that they'll take, especially if you're going to purchase for a long period of time. So if you go in with a volume idea or a commitment that you're going to have work for them for six months, 12 months, they will likely be a little more flexible on their price point. And if you can find the right fit, this would always be the best case scenario. You're going to have all the benefits of an outsourced company. You're not going to have to deal with all the internal stuff from the real estate and hiring and firing and hassles or you know office gossip and all the other nonsense that comes from managing a whole handful of telemarketers in one space at one time. You've got one person, they work for you, they work in their home office, you don't have to provide them with any equipment, you don't have to provide them with access to your systems, all you have to do is say, here's how many meetings I want every month, or here's how many dials I want every month, and they go to work. So best case scenario, if you can find the right fit. The cons, of course, are this is very difficult to control. They're a 1099 contractor. In order for you to meet the 20 question rule for 1099 classification, you can't actually tell them how to do their job. You can't actually provide them with any tools to do their job. They have to be able to come and go as they please, work when they want, and work how they want. So if you want any control at all over your program, it's going to be hard for you to work with a 1099. It does open you up to some misclassification challenges. So if somebody gets disgruntled six months into it and decides to contest that they should have been an employee, you could open yourself up for some risk there. Probably they're not going to understand managed services unless you somehow manage to stumble into the perfect employee, or pardon me, the perfect contractor that maybe worked with an MSP previously. 
So you're going to need to train them the same way that you would train an in-house employee. So there's a lot of opportunity cost that comes from bringing someone in and then having to take your valuable time to educate, train, and manage them. So you've kind of got the worst of both worlds on that one. You're going to have the same sorts of problems as with an in-house hire. If there's only one person that you can rely on to do your lead generation and they decide to go on vacation for a month or one of their kids gets sick, all of a sudden you don't have that pipeline build anymore and you can't do anything about it. So those would be the negatives. So if you want to try it, where would you find one? Craigslist is as good a place as any. Any job posting board, and again, if you personality profile them before you hire them, you can predict accurately who's going to be good at it and who isn't. You could use a site like Elance or Odesk or Freelancer or Fiverr or Work Market or Field Nation. Uh, at the beginning, when we started our company, we tried people off of all of these sites. And some of them worked out really well for a while. Some of them didn't. Uh, the biggest challenge with those sites is quite often they won't let you talk to anybody before you hire them, so you have no idea what your caller sounds like and that's going to be important. It does protect you from any 1099 misclassification because the websites share that risk with you. And if you can hire them for a short project first, once you've actually engaged with someone through Elance or Freelancer or Fiverr, you can communicate with them directly. So that way if you hire them for you know, a 10 hour project and everything goes great, then maybe you can hire them for a 50 hour project and see if everything goes great. But you can hire for a couple of, I mean it's going to cost you 50 bucks to find out or $100 to find out, so why not? I would say that if you are looking for a cost effective way to outsource your lead gen, using an external contractor is not a bad idea. Now let's talk about offshoring. It's going to be less expensive than any other form of outsourcing, including using those 1099s that we just talked about. So if you're going to use a 1099 that you're going to hire off eDesk or o Elance or Odesk, they're going to be charging North American prices. It's still going to be less expensive than hiring in-house, and it's nice because you can hire them for the amount of time that you want them for, but it's still going to be a North America price. Offshore is obviously going to be offshore pricing, so you're going to expect to pay less for that. Higher volume, meaning they can dial forever. You know, if you're paying your team $3 an hour, you can put hundreds of people on your project. High volume means more potential opportunities. So if you look, think back to that revenue line that I showed you a couple of slides ago about how much volume has to go in the top in order for deals to come out the bottom, offshore providers can put things in the top of the funnel. And they're great for creating marketing ready leads, but not sales ready leads. So the amount of work you're going to do yourself is still going to be significant, but if all you want is somebody to call out and invite people to an event that you're having, or if you want someone to call out and ask if you can email them some information, anything that you can train to step by step that doesn't vary at all, an offshore company is great for. So the cons, of course, are they can't go off script at all. So they can't have a meaningful conversation with your prospects. They can ask them one question that they're trained to over and over and over again. And if the answer to that question is at all out of the script, they are going to struggle. You know that they're offshore. Your prospects are going to know that as well. So your brand could suffer a little bit. They're not going to understand managed services, and they're not going to be able to speak intelligently to them, and they're not going to be able to escalate opportunities appropriately. So our callers, for example, know how to listen for pain while they're having a conversation. The callers that you work with in an offshore call center are going to have conversations. They're not going to comprehend them. They're listening for very specific things. They're listening for yes, and if yes, go to step two, and if no, go to step three. So they are following a very specific script that they have been trained to over and over again, and they cannot deviate from it. So if you can develop a program, if you want to do something very specific in your market, perhaps invite a whole bunch of people to one place at one time, an offshore provider is not a bad choice. So the ideal uses for offshore, data collection, you want to confirm addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses. If you're trying to build an email, email newsletter opt-in list, well, if all they have to do is say, can we send you some information? And anything that doesn't require going off script, those are ideal uses for offshore call centers. You'll keep your costs low, and you'll still get quite a bit of volume. How do you choose one? First of all, make sure that you can talk to their callers. The person who's pitching you is likely the best person they have there. 
They are not the people that are making your call, so do not assume for a minute that just because the person that's pitching you sounds like their English is pretty good, that the offshore providers are going to be using similar talent for your dials. Are you able to listen to the calls? Are you able to engage with the callers? Can you interview the callers that might be placed on your campaign? If you get the opportunity to do that, the, the best way to test whether or not they have great English skills is to start asking them questions that nobody would ever ask them in a sales campaign. What's their favorite type of ice cream? How many kids do they have? Just ask them you know, simple chatty questions that they couldn't possibly have been trained to. You'll identify pretty quickly what their English comprehension is like. And English comprehension is far more important than English diction. If their correspondence with you is littered with grammatical and spelling errors, the correspondence they send out on your behalf is going to look exactly the same. Remember, they're putting their best foot forward to engage with you. And if their best foot forward sounds like their English is broken and reads like their English is broken, the team that's supporting your program is going to sound worse. Remember, this is the best they have. That's why they're calling you. So another option is to work with an outsourced company that charges pay per lead. And on the surface, that sounds like a great idea. Right? It's a low risk, low risk for you, assuming that they've got a fair resolution process and they're an ethical company. You're only going to pay for appointments. The cons working with, and we tried paper lead when we started our company. Right? We thought that it did, it, it shared risk with everybody. It was a whole lot easier to sell, so why not try it? We were fairly confident in our ability to deliver. And there are challenges on both sides of that relationship, not with the, just the solution provider, but, but with us as well. So when we scheduled what we felt was a good meeting, somebody would come back to us and say, well, I didn't like that meeting. And I could say, well, it hit all of the things that you said it needed to hit. They were interested in a solution. They had a minimum of a year, they had a maximum of one year left on their contract. There was 50 computers or more on location, and they accepted the meeting and you attended it. That's a qualified meeting, and they would say, well, they didn't buy anything from us. <laughs> so it's very difficult as a solution provider to control that pay-per-lead relationship. From your standpoint or from where you're sitting, pay-per-lead sounds fantastic, right? There's very little risk in it. Now, if you are talking to a company that is charging you less than $700 to $1,000 per meeting, don't work with them. That's how much leads cost. That's how much they're worth. So if they're saying they can get you meetings for $200, I guarantee you that they cannot because I know what my overhead is here. Meetings will be scheduled to hit quota, not based on actual opportunities. So when a company comes to you and says, I guarantee you that we can get you 10 appointments this month, that it just can't be done. How can you guarantee that there's going to be 10 opportunities in somebody's market every month? Those meetings aren't going to be qualified the same way a company that isn't charging you per meeting could qualify them. They'll have loose qualifying parameters. They're going to be less valuable for you. And personally, when I think about the amount of time that I have to invest in a sales meeting, so preparing for that meeting, driving to that meeting, or sometimes for me flying to that meeting, spending an hour to two hours on site, follow up, you're going to spend eight hours preparing for and recovering from a sales meeting. Regardless of the cost of the meeting, my time is valuable and I only want to go on qualified meetings. And you should feel the same way about your meetings. The resolution process with pay per lead companies is often very complex and they're controlling it. So nobody's going to charge you after the fact for your meetings. They are going to bill you beforehand because nobody wants to have the fight at the end about was it qualified, wasn't it qualified. So you're going to pay a large amount up front for your bucket of appointments and then they're going to deplete that like a pay-as-you-go phone. So you're going to hand over a lot of money and you're going to hope that the meetings that they produce for you are going to be fantastic. High pressure sales tactics usually result because remember they're only getting paid if there's a meeting and that can damage your brand and your market. If you can appropriately train their team and if they will allow you access to their team, this isn't a horrible option, especially if they're pretty good at what they do. As long as they'll allow you access and you can engage with them, you can create a pretty powerful paper lead engine. You want to ask again, where are your colors located? 
do not accept the answer, our company is located in California. You're not asking where the company is located in. Where are the callers that are going to be making your calls located? You want to find out, is this company that's charging you $1,000 a lead offshoring their calling? And if they are, well, you can pay $9 an hour for offshore callers. You don't need to pay $1,000 a lead. You can offshore yourself. So don't work with a company that's offshoring your sales appointment setting and charging you $1,000 an appointment. To be successful with a paper lead company, define your qualifying parameters very aggressively and don't accept anything that doesn't exactly match them. So don't let the company come back to you and say, I know you said you only wanted things that had 50 or more seats. This one has 40. Will you take it? Absolutely not. You will not take it because you're paying $1,000 a lead and you should get exactly what you're paying for. Make sure you read the contract and have them define the resolution process independently of that contract in writing. Have the sales rep or the CEO of the company clearly state what the resolution process is in a document in plain English so that you can go back to them afterwards and say, here is what you promised me. The contracts can be written in a very, very sneaky manner. I've looked at a lot of our competitors' contracts and there's all kinds of stuff in there that makes my skin crawl. When in doubt, have a lawyer review your contracts. It's only going to cost you a couple hundred dollars and it's going to save you a huge headache down the road. Don't sign a long-term agreement with a company that you've never engaged with before. A lot of companies will try to pressure you into year-long agreements. With a paper lead company, pay more for the lead short-term so that you can test out working with them. You don't want to be stuck in a year-long relationship with a company that's sending you garbage. And nobody can guarantee you that there are X number of opportunities, whether that's four, six, ten. Nobody can do that. There's no way to tell. So what they're saying is we are going to magically pull ten opportunities out of the sky for you every month. Be very wary of the monthly guarantee. There is really no way for anyone to guarantee that they can get you meetings. So you can work with a set rate outsourced provider. We are a set rate outsourced provider. There are usually fewer leads and the leads are normally higher quality. They're not using high pressure sales tactics. They're looking for the best fit. The reputable firms, and if you would like a list of our competitors after this webinar, you are welcome to send me an email and I will provide them to you. We only work with one MSP in any given market. There's lots of business for everyone, and if you want to shop around, there are plenty of businesses that I would give my money to if I wasn't running one that competed with them. They have good talent, they have great process, and they're usually far more collaborative with clients, and they're far more willing to let you come in and participate in the training and the onboarding process. Cons, of course, these companies will be the most expensive, but they also have the highest reward potential. They're often not very flexible. They've created a process that they can scale and they don't want to mess with it too much. We're the same. I don't want to work in your ConnectWise system. I don't want to work in your Autotask system. I have a system that I've created. We've trained everybody to it. We've automated as much of the process as we can and I don't want to give you variable options. That's not a managed service. That is a professional service and it costs twice as much. A set rate solution provider that isn't niche specific isn't going to understand managed services. And I don't think that I need to toot my own horn on this one, but if you talk to companies that worked with other outsourced firms before they came to us, the consistent messaging was they said they knew what managed services was, they said that they could do it, and it turns out that they could not. Other con is a contract is usually longer and they can be worded sneaky. So again, like any contract, review them before you engage. So with the right company, you're going to have control and consistency. And again, that same question, where are your colors located? Not where is your company located? You can offshore yourself if you want to work with offshore callers. Some markets, offshore callers work fine. And other markets, it goes really, really poorly. You probably know your market better than I do. So if you think that you could effectively get away with an offshore caller, go engage one yourself. Don't hire an expensive lead generation agency to mediate that relationship. You're going to get the same quality and caliber of results whether you manage it or the third party company manages it. Define your qualifying parameters aggressively. Read your contract. Have them define the resolution process. Don't sign a long term agreement unless you've tested out the relationship. If they won't offer you a pilot, there's a reason for that and nobody can guarantee you 
that there are opportunities in your market. Be wary of the monthly guarantee. And again, full disclosure, of course, I'm invested in you making this choice, but I think that Managed Sales Pros has all the best features of a set rate company, and we combine that with a deep understanding of the managed services market. We provide consistent call volume. We protect your brand. Our terms are flexible. You can try us out before you commit to a long-term engagement. Our callers are located in North America. We match accent to accent where we can, so quite often, you will not see a caller from Georgia trying to penetrate the New York market. That doesn't work very well. Our callers are all trained to pitch managed and IT services. From day one, they are trained on how to sell that solution. We've got plenty of references and we'll give you access to the clients where things didn't go well, so you can see how we resolved that as well. You get direct access to everyone on your team. And what's the con? We're not cheap. But no matter who you choose, be consistent and be patient. Our clients are seeing over 500% ROI on their telemarketing programs, but they didn't start realizing that ROI for 12 to 18 months. I put 18 on there to kind of set expectations. 12 to 18 months is when your telemarketing program starts to pay off. So it's not a magic bullet. If you're expecting to hire a lead generation firm of any kind, have them come in and you're going to sign deals months two, it just doesn't happen like that. You need to come in with realistic expectations, enough money to run a program for a year, and remember that the more dials you put in, the more opportunities you're going to see come out the bottom of the funnel. Most important, don't stop start. When you're ready to do this, keep going. Frustrated or not, Meetings or not, keep going. Of all the options that we discussed, the worst one is do it for three months, drop it for three months. Do it for three months, drop it for three months. So this is what the revenue curve looks like when you stop and start. So this is assuming you did three months of calling and then did nothing for three months and then did three months of calling and did nothing for three months. So you can see that very, very flat outsourced line and then you can see the blue line going up. That's a normal campaign where you just call 100 dials a week with that $2,000 a month average deal and a 0.05 conservative conversion rate from first follow-up to sale. And that outsource line, that flat line, that's what happens when you can't make a commitment. So the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time to start or to plant a tree is today, regardless of what you want to do, I encourage you to start now. You don't have to make the decision and stick with it forever, but you do need to make a choice of some kind. So the biggest factor in sales prospecting success is consistent volume. When you look back on those graphs that I showed you throughout the course of the slides, the ones with the revenue numbers that go up are the ones that are throwing volume in consistently. There's no breakup of the process, there's no sales rep that quits, there's no pause in the program. You just have to keep going. No activity for one quarter means no follow-ups for three quarters, and that means no sales appointments. It doesn't need to be perfect, it needs to be done. So don't worry if you don't have everything in a line, if you're going to outsource. If you're going to hire in-house, yes, you have to make sure everything is ready. Because if you bring somebody in and you're not prepared to train them, educate them, manage them, and support them, they will fail and they will leave. So that's all I have for you guys today. We do have a free download available to you. It is the MSP's Ultimate Guide to Cold Calling, and Intronus was good enough to partner with us to get this built for us. We really like it. There's lots of great tips in there, so if you're thinking about bringing someone in-house to do your cold calling, here's a tool that can get you started. Great. Thanks, Jerry. No uh, yep, so um, for those interested, you can download that ebook. It's free. Uh, we created the URL, intronus.com forward slash cold calling. Um, you can access that anytime to download the free ebook. Um, and Carrie, we do have some time here. I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions. Great. So, so if anyone has any questions, you may submit them to the right of your GoToWebinar screen in the, the questions or chat panel. 
and we will answer some questions. And Carrie, we do have a few questions in here already. Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, will this webinar be recorded? And it is being recorded, and it will be sent out you know, within a few hours or so. So if anyone missed any parts of the webinar or would like to listen to the replay, that will be available shortly. The, the next question uh, is, what's not cheap? What is an example <laughs> of your, your pricing? Uh, we charge $6,000 a month. And we offer market exclusivity. So if we work with you, we don't work with another MSP in your market. Next question here. Suggestions for a small MSP that doesn't have deep budgets for this type of activity? Well, I think you would want to go with one of the less expensive outsourcing options to begin with or start trying it on your own. So when, like not knowing anything about your business, it's really hard to give you any advice. Do you have any spare time? Can you make any dials on your own? And if not, probably hiring someone off Elance to get started. I mean, there's, there's lots of pros and cons to any of the options that we talked about today, but I think the biggest con is doing nothing. And so it, decide what you can spend and then act accordingly. You know, if you've only got $500 a month to spend on outbound marketing, you may want to engage someone to make 10 hours of calls for you every week. Be great. Our next, next question is, how do you train your people slash callers to get them up to speed? We have a full training program in place now. So we have a um, like 25 hours of training that we take them through that starts, starts with very basic, here's our company, here's what we believe in, here are the tools that we use, and then training on all of those tools. And then we go into the, the basics of cold calling. Now, how do you ask an open-ended versus a closed-ended questions? Just the, the stuff that you would learn if you were going to cold call for any type of solution. And then we go into specific managed services cold call training. So how do you get through the gatekeeper? If somebody says, we already have that, how do you get around that objection? If someone says, we've got in-house IT, what do you do next? What conversations do you have with the IT department? What conversations would you have with a controller? A lot of that is covered in that free ebook. So if you want to learn a little bit about how we educate our callers, that ebook's a great place to start because a lot of the things that we developed in-house to train our team, we shared with Intronus in that book. Great. The next question here is, what is a typical size of your MSP clients? We work with companies usually around the 2 million to 5 million range. We do have some smaller MSPs, and then we do have some larger multi-location MSPs. The sweet spot for us is usually companies where the CEO is still involved day-to-day -day with the sales process, whether they want to be or not. So if they're the ones going out on the sales meetings still, a company like ours can support that initiative very well. And then if you've got multiple sales reps who really should be responsible for growing your base, you can eliminate a lot of their cold calling legwork by, by being supported by a company like ours. And a, a follow-on to that would be how many calls per month would you make for a 2 million MSP approximately? Uh, well, it really depends on the market that you're located in. So there are what I would call tier one markets. So you're looking at your New Yorks of the world, Miami, places where you could call forever and never run out of leads. You do a very different type of program in a tier one market than you would in a tier two or three market. So if you look at a tier three market where you might have 500 leads to pursue, that probably isn't going to be a great fit for a company like ours because we're going to need volume to be successful. So if you have a very finite number of leads, you're going to have less success cold calling from the beginning. You're going to have to take a more targeted approach. So to the point earlier about what kinds of MSPs are you working for, if you don't look at it from a revenue standpoint, look at it from a how big is your market standpoint, will cold calling work in your market, you're looking for a minimum of 1,000 leads to dial if you're going to use an outsourced cold calling firm. Otherwise, you're just going to end up hitting those 500 leads over and over and over and over and over again. And that doesn't work as well. 
So how many, I guess, how many dials would you make is going to be dependent on how many dials are there to make. Okay, great. Um, next question here, Carrie, goes back to the training question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you offer that training for in-house VDMs or exclusively to your man of sales pros employees? We have a five-week online training program that we make available to the market. Uh, we usually offer it quarterly. I think our next one begins in April. It's about, it's about a 25-hour commitment over a five-week period. It costs $2,500, and I mean, there's an unlimited number of seats available on it. There is some follow-up homework that we kind of expect people to do, uh, and it's appropriate for business owners that want to learn how to cold call, as well as sales reps that, weren't, that want to learn. We also do a two-day on-site course for companies that want to have their own programs. And where, where can the attendees uh, find that information, Carrie? Uh, on our website, there should be a, a drop-down called training and that should list the next available dates. So managedsalespros.com services training, I think, is the uh, branch to get there. Okay, great, thank you. And we'll give everyone another minute or so if there's any additional questions. Feel free, to, feel free to submit them and we can answer them for you. So we'll give everyone about a minute or so, Carrie. Okay. All right. It does look like that's all the questions we have to, for today. Great. And well, I want thanks, to, everyone. <laughs> yep. I want to thank you, Carrie, for presenting today, and I want to thank the attendees for joining us for another great, great webinar session on cold calling. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.